From the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, this is Nebraska Farmcast. I'm Ryan Evans. Consumers seem willing to pay more for their burgers and meatballs with continued strong demand despite ground beef prices remaining high. What does this mean for cattle producers thinking about expanding their herds this fall? We're going to explore that question with our guest on this episode, Elliot Dennis, Assistant Professor and Livestock Marketing Economist with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He recently wrote an in-depth analysis looking at factors like retail beef prices, slaughter cow prices, heifers on feed, and more. And he joins me now. Hi, Elliot. Hi, Ryan. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for being here again. So what do you believe has been the primary driver behind the sustained high culling rates recently? Well, really, when we start, we talk about where do, why do we produce cattle? And that's because consumers eat beef and they eat lots of types of beef, right? They don't just eat steaks. And one of the things that consumers really love is eating ground beef so much that we actually import ground beef because there's such a high demand. So if we got rid of all of our uh, demand for imports, then we ground beef prices would be even higher. So we bring in ground beef, we ship over more high value products like steaks to places like Japan and and South Korea and, and China. And so when we talk about where that demand is really coming from, consumers seem continually willing to pay. Uh, a pretty high price for ground beef, and that's what they're what we actually observe them paying in the store. Um, and when we talk about what would they be willing to pay, there's it's really like a dollar or two more than what they're currently already paying. And so consumers seem like they are able to stomach a little bit higher ground beef prices, which should suggest that they are gonna um, at least try to meet some of that um, higher value in the future. Given the fluctuation in ground beef prices and then the trends that uh, you've discussed, how do you anticipate consumer behaviors might evolve in the coming year? You mentioned you you suspect demand isn't going anywhere, even if prices were to rise a couple of dollars. But um, anything that you see uh, in your crystal ball as far as consumer behavior? Yeah, so what we've noticed over the past several years is that we often talk about substitution between consumers, which really what that means is uh, when a consumer goes to a you know a meat case, they're thinking I have so many dollars to spend on meat, and I'm gonna you know look at prices and quantities. I'm gonna chew a, a certain number of you know pounds of beef and so many pounds of pork and so many pounds of chicken. Well, what we would normally assume is that when prices of beef go up, then people are gonna say I'm not gonna consume as much of that, and I'm gonna switch into consuming pork. It assumes that they're gonna have a certain level of protein intake. What we actually are starting to see is that people are actually switching more within products. And so people who eat beef or can continue to eat beef, but they're just not going to eat maybe that, you know, ribeye or T-bone. They're going to go down to maybe a sirloin or in, you know, extreme cases, maybe they'll just eat more ground beef. And so when we talk about, you know, that demand not going anywhere, if um, consumers continue to have pretty heavy inflation Wages aren't fully keeping up. Uh, We talk about just other things within the economy that are happening. And and then overlaying that with what what consumers' behavior is, what they tend to substitute down, we're going to have just more demand for that ground beef. It's going to pull up that price. And so what do processors and retailers want to do? They want to purchase more of that product. And that just sends signals all the way down the supply chain that we need more ground beef. So it's important to know where do we actually get ground beef trimmings from. And how significant is the role of beef trimming imports, uh, which you've talked about a little bit already, but especially from countries like Australia and Brazil, as you write about in your new article, how important are those imports to shaping domestic market prices and then decisions related to culling? Yeah. So we have, uh, we really get ground beef trimmings from three areas. We have domestic fed uh, cattle productions, that's as they're trimming, you know, the steers and heifers as they're coming through the plants. They have meat and fat, and they're, you know, meeting grinding specifications. The other is cold cows. So that's dairy cows and beef cows. And majority of those, that percentage of that carcass is uh, essentially ground beef trimmings. And then we have imports. And what we see if we look at, Im- you know, ground beef over time is that the relative input to ground beef from fed cattle is relatively stable. It's gonna fluctuate a little bit with the number of animals that we harvest. And then historically imports have been relatively stable. 
what's really fluctuated as um, has kind of gone up and down it has been uh, the coal cow market. And so uh, when we're coaling a lot, we import a little bit less. And when we're, uh, you know, we're not coaling as much, we imp import more. What's been happening is that we've been coaling more, but imports have been going down. And so that's really going to, is sending these signals we call price inversion. Normally we'd expect as we go into the fall that uh, slaughter cow and cutter cow prices would go down. That's the seasonal trend. And what we've actually been seeing is that since July, they've been pretty much maintained flat. So there's this pretty large price gap between what we'd expect it to be. And that's because imports are not there. And since imports aren't there, we need to continue to try to incentivize producers to, to slaughter more cows, both on the dairy side and the beef side. And so how do we do that? In a market economy, we keep prices higher. Uh, and that's how we kind of ration through things. And so as we start talking about, well, if prices are such that I can take my money now and coal my cows and potentially sell higher heifers in the fall, or I could say I'm going to continue to breed them, you know, sell bread, bread cows or uh, this fall or keep them and get feeder cattle. But that means I have to wait an entire year uh, in order to get that income. And so it's kind of this trade off between you know, what are we going to do today versus what can we do, you know, next year? In your article, which is up on our website at cap.unl.edu, you uh, discuss the dilemma that producers face between current market values and then those potential future profits. So from your perspective, what strategy does offer the best long-term benefit for producers? I think you have to think about what your current situation is and your, and your cash flow needs. We're talking about how how likely you're able to withstand that risk. Uh, there's, I've talked to some producers who have said, you know, we feel like we can make more money now with, we know that profit is going to be today. We're less certain about what that profit is going to be in the future. And so we're going to call a significant portion of our herd and we're going to sell either our, them either as open cows, bread cows, and we're going to sell off our, our steers and heifers. But others that feel like the market will can just continually rise higher. And so they're retaining a lot of heifers. And so I think it has to do with where you're at financially in that situation and kind of what your expectations are. If you are retaining, what I would uh, strongly recommend is that you actually sit down and you pencil it out. If I'm buying cows today in the fall, bred cows, how long does that do I need to own that animal in order for it to pay itself off? It's an investment every time you buy one of those. And so there's a lot of factors, and we've written previous articles that are also available at cap.unl.edu that actually talk about what are those factors. And we also provide a tool where you can actually go in and put your own assumptions in and figure out what is that payoff period. And it basically what happens is it tells you what is the value that you're willing, you are able to pay for that bread cow. So that's the first thing. The second is what is the value of that heifer? Anytime you retain a heifer, you're choosing to forego that profit. And so if you're choosing to forego that profit, you have some expectation that that heifer is going to bring more value in the future. And so being aware of what that value, if you choose to retain heifers in your own operation, what is the value of that income that you're foregoing? And so sometimes the value that we're incoming foregoing, and then we say, okay, projected in the future, I need a certain level of income. What has to go right for you to get for that to actually occur? And just being aware of what that risk and that business decision that you're making. Um, and so for some people, they've kind of looked at that and they've said, you know, I'm just going to take that income now uh, and forego that profit because they believe the risk is too high. And some producers that I've talked to have said, listen, I think we can make more money and this is how we're going to manage around some of those risks. So for each producer, they have to basically put the business plan and just kind of know what you're accepting rather than, uh, planning and that, or not planning and then hoping for something to occur. Great. Yeah. And, uh, kind of related to that, we'll let listeners know just to stay tuned to cap.unl.edu or sign up for our email newsletter there. Cause, uh, we're looking at holding a webinar here toward the end of 2023 on, uh, 2024 heifer replacement price forecasts. Um, so Elliot, with the uncertainty surrounding whether heifers will be retained to rebuild the beef cow herd, can you shed some light on maybe potential implications that this could have on the industry at large in the next two to three years? 
Yeah, I would say there's a general sentiment out there that we're going to retain a lot of heifers. Um, and the reason why is because feeder cattle prices are, are, are what I would view as extremely high right now. Uh, in Nebraska, we've already topped, you know, $3 a pound. And, uh, and we've been that there for, you know, several weeks. So I think there's a lot of optimism that prices are going to continue to be at least that high, if not higher, moving into the fall or the fall and into the next year. And so really, I think the, what I was, you know, trying to say is, you know, we might continue to go higher, but depending upon people's decisions with culling determines, I think, how high we can go. If we see a lot of culling this fall, uh, you know, from now till December, that price could go pretty high because every animal that we take out is a feeder cattle that's not born next year. And so that's the first thing. The second is the heifer on feed. If we, in December, we'll come out with a heifer on feed report. We'll basically know during the fall run, how many heifers were pulled into the feed yard. If that number is high, that will even push that feed, uh, feeder cattle or 2024 feeder cattle price even higher. Because every heifer we put in the feed yard is every heifer that's not going to be bred next year and produce feeder cattle. Uh, so those are kind of those, those two decisions. And we have to th start to think, okay, how many heifers are we retaining? How many heifers are we going to breed? And how many of those cows are we going to take out? Combined, we get our total breeding stock that produce feeder cattle for that next year. Then we know supply. Um, and ultimately... Supply is, is going to what's going to drive, you know, price given steady demand. So I'm really excited about this fall. I think it's going to be really interesting as far as market dynamics uh, and some really op opportune times for some producers to make what I think is a lot of money, both now and in the future. And so watching those decisions uh, take place is going to be really, you know, important. And the fact that we need to have good information um, I'm always here to help. Feel free to call, write, or text, and we can uh, have those conversations or get with your market advisor or another person and just kind of talk through these situations. And with that, I think we can be the most successful that we can. Great. Well, that's Elliot Dennis, Assistant Professor, Livestock Marketing Economist here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Department of Agricultural Economics and Center for Ag Profitability. And you can find his contact information on our website at calf.unl.edu. We've linked to his new article on what we've been talking about here on this episode. That's in the notes for the podcast if you're listening on your favorite app out there. And of course, on our website at calf.unl.edu. Thanks so much, Elliot. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Nebraska Farmcast is a production of the Center for Agricultural Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. For the latest research-based information and education resources to manage your farm or ranch operation, visit our website at cap.unl.edu. That's cap.unl.edu.